welcome. This is a great uh, show down at Peabody's. Yep. Downstairs. Wonderful audience. New new band, new album. Yep. Um, the, basically the drummer, drummer of the last band, last time we were here, got a bit eccentric. So I, I know I know maybe I should have kept an except eccentric drummer, but we decided that he was a bit. Too a bit deceit, deceitful and stuff, so we ended up getting the new guy in who, he's a steadier drummer anyway, and our keyboard player, when we were recording in New York, our keyboard player went mad, he came as para <laughs> paranoid schizophrenic, which was rather heavy at the time, but it, it was one thing I've always found actually is that keyboard players can tend to be a little bit... Um, Quiet and sometimes annoying. Actually, the, the Who's keyboard player, a Rabbit, I always loved because he was he was different. But most keyboard players, I find, are very wrapped in themselves. And I, I, on the road, you, you tend to want people that are a bit more uppish as as people. And guitarists and bass players and drummers are always up. And um, so we decided to use a computer keyboard which is an emulator and it, it does what a keyboard player will do except we have to play to it. Uh, that means you program all the songs and it's almost like play, playing with the accompaniment of a tape recording, right? It's almost like that. The only difference is is that you have to give it a command for it to do something. Um, so we've got a, a guy on the side of the stage who can give it the right commands at the right times and, he, and, it, and it works well. Now you are touring with your second album. You did Sweet Sounds last time around. And the Sweet Sounds album that you did was done with a lot of the people from uh, Big Country. It was, well, Big Country is a very close part of my family, as it were. I was, I, I was brought up in a place called Ealing in London um, with various friends, one, one very close to me, Tony Butler who's the bassist of Big Country, and the drummer, Mark Pazicki, who joined me when I was about 15. I'm 24 now. Um, we, we were, we played, Tony and I, the bass player and myself, played together f right the way through school and everything from when I was about 10. Uh, Mark joined me when I was about 15. We were a very, very close unit, but didn't manage to get anywhere, I think, because of management and um, the companies, the companies in London at the time were ch were changing personnel, which never helped. And in the end, we had to split up. There was no, there was no choice. We just had to split up to to have any success individually. So they split and became big country, and you went off on your own. Yeah. And right now, everything's still a very close unit. We're still always together. I mean, I see them as much as I see my band. And it, it's, a, it's great to be part of a family. Like we all come from the same area, and we all love the same sort of music. But um, I do want to play with them again someday. I don't know in what context or how, but I'm sure we will. We respect each other totally. Um, it's good. Now, your older brother is Peter Tan, who was with The Who. There's a there's a big age difference between you two, isn't there? 16 years. And I remember the last time I met you, you said you really didn't get to spend much time with your brother when you were growing up because he was on the road so much. Well, I, when I was when I was about six or five or six, I think I went to the first Who concert I ever saw. And I know I actually grew up with Pete in the house because by the time I was born, what what by the time. Stupid thing to say. <laughs> by, the, by the time I was about two, You've got a great memory. <laughs> by the time I was about two, I do have slight memories of Pete being in the same household. But apart from that, he moved upstairs in the house that we had. That we've got two separate flats. My mum and dad's house. I still own the same house. Now, was Pete into breaking furniture as much as he was into breaking amps and guitars? No, he was. He was. Um, he did that on stage. It was a gimmick. Everything that we do, everything that I do on stage is all gimmick. It's all, you know, you come off stage and you feel sometimes a little bit 
um, people people come up to you and expect maybe a bit more than you can offer as a person because they expect you to do that, you know. <laughs> but you don't because you just not, you're just a normal person. You know, on stage it's a different thing altogether. You you you're in front of an audience. You might have friends in the audience. I get this a lot in London where, when I play there. You know, you get like an audience of people and you can literally recognise every single one of them up front. And um, they're all saying, hi, hi, you know me? You know, and your eyes just pass through these, this because it's a performance you're doing, not a, a show for your mates. It's something that your adrenaline is, is pumping and you, you're, you're in a different frame of mind. Do you think it was really more difficult or easier for you to grow up having a famous brother in the music business and you're in the same business? Um, well, all I know is, all I know is that when I was eight, Pete gave me my first guitar. I was singing Who anyway. For was it in one piece when he gave singing. it to you? Well, it was a smashed up guitar, actually, that he'd stuck back together. At the time, the Who didn't have a lot of money, so they were like, piecing them back together, piecing them back together to smash again. Um, my, my instinct, as soon as I got that guitar, was to write. I don't, I'm not a great, as you can see on stage, I'm not an incredibly technical guitar player. My, that's probably why I brought on another guitarist. Um, but I can play, I'm solid, as it were. Um, good enough to write songs. Piano also I got very attached to from when from the age of ten I started to, I bought my first piano myself and I and I found because of, I the guitar it's sometimes a very sticky instrument and especially when you're learning you can't actually play a chord cleanly on a, on a piano you just have to make sure your fingers are somewhere in the right place and you can play a chord so to write songs which was my instinct I I found it a lot easier. Um, my mum was a singer, my dad was a sax player and a clarinet player. So it's not only Pete's influence, but even my grandparents were in the music business. Um, they were a sort of singing duo, my granddad and his brother. Do you have any other brothers and sisters in the business? A brother called Paul in the middle, Pete and I. He's four years old than I am. He's also musical. So all of us were into the, the music business. I, I, by nature, took up music and I, and I, I, I firmly believe that even if, if Pete hadn't been a, a rock musician, I would have been, because that, that, that's now, isn't it? I mean, my dad was a jazz musician because that was what was happening then. Um, I mean, I, I also like to make it clear to people that to learn to play an instrument, it's not an easy thing. And you either have to live it and learn by what you do, by your mistakes and by your efforts, or you don't learn. And I really put my heart into it. And I didn't have anyone saying, learn. You know, Pete was never there. He was away, you know, he was out on the road with the hood. I saw him once a year, probably Christmas Day. Um, so I, I put my heart into it myself and I learned how to play the, the instruments that I can play. I, you know, it's something that was inbuilt in me. Now, Pete produced your first album. Did it have anything to do with the second album that you've got out right now? No, he didn't. Um, not for any uh, bad reasons or malice. Or we just decided that after the first record, the only way we were going to work together again was on a record together, um, which won't happen until I establish myself because I wouldn't do any more work with Pete. Because I think what he did was really helpful to open a few doors, maybe. But I've always tried to, to you know, shrug it off a bit. Obviously, you, you must understand that it is very really difficult. Very difficult. You've got a big shadow you're in there. Well, a lot of people feel that. I don't feel like it's a shadow. I feel more that it's um, competition. I feel that that Duran Duran are competition. I feel that that's so much. Something's just dropped one of my amps. <laughs> <laughs> I feel there's a lot of competition out there, and it's not only the Who. I mean, when I was when I was young, I started listening to records, ooh, millions of different artists, and uh, I was very, very into ballads at one time. Then I got very into, like 
James Taylor and Supertramp. I love Todd Rundgren, Peter Gabriel. I, got, I went through phases of Genesis and Yes and things like that. Then I got into The Clash and The Jam and The Sex Pistols. And, you know, I've been through a very mixed bag of what I like. And I, right now I'm very into Dalvin and John Oates and I'm very into things like Tubes even. You know. Um, the Who weren't the only influence on me. Uh, speaking about The Who, you were lucky enough to go to Live Aid and I'm sure you were in a great position to watch just about everything. Your brother came back and they had the reunion of the, of the Who. What was your reaction to, aside from being there, which had to be an experience itself, just seeing the group back together again? I was, I was moved by the whole day. I mean, it was, I also met a lot of people that I've always wanted to meet. And I felt that on that particular day, there wasn't any um, of the I'm a superstar and you're not. It, because everything, everything was balanced. It was like... Everybody had 20 minutes to do yeah, their set. Yeah. And then Phil that's Collins. it. If you're Phil, Phil Collins or Madonna yeah. or the, the opening they, act or whatever. They all wanted to meet each other. Everyone wanted to be friendly and part of something even if it, even if I may may say this in some ways it was not only for the, the starving people in Ethiopia it was also for for a feeling of beating the government at what they should really have been able to deal with themselves but couldn't because n the, you couldn't get Margaret Thatcher to gather so many people under one roof no way you couldn't get um, any of the government people to form such a vast thing for such a purpose. Bob Geldof was the guy behind it all and God bless him, he did a great job. And I, also, I sort of felt that in a way everyone, everyone wanted him to be successful in it. It was like everyone wanted to help, for not only for the cause but for the feeling of, of beating Superiors, people that are supposed to be. Red tape and yeah. everything else. That's hey, it. let's You're remain kind, let's help tape, say, sorry. You know, you, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to be a bit nasty about it. It was, it was a great feeling of beating people that talk rubbish a lot of the time and don't do what they say they're going to do. You know, there was one guy that did what, what he was said he was going to do and he stuck by it, and that was Bob Geldof. And um, you know, it saved a lot of lives. What uh, would you say would be the most moving moment for you at Live Aid? There were a lot of moving moments. Obviously the Who's reunion was moving. I, I even got moved by the Led Zeppelin reunion watching it on film. I, I, I felt U2's performance was really strong and I really got touched by um, Sting and Collins together. Bowie and Jagger was, was great, maybe a little bit trivial in a way, I thought it was a, something slightly jokey about it, but it was all, it was all there to, for the cause. The whole thing moved me, it was amazing. The Who was just part of it for me. Obviously The Who is, is always going to have a different effect on me than it will everyone else. But I thought really you two are excellent. To be there on the side of the stage and watch was wonderful. Well, now you have an album out right now, uh, Moving Target, I believe is, is the name, on Polygram. Yeah. You're on a tour. You're going where from here? Well, tomorrow we leave for LA. Um, How many dates on the tour? This, this is a very, very brief tour. We're hoping, well, we should be linking up with uh, major support over the next week or so. If we don't, then we're going back to England for a week or so. I'm gonna, I've got some promo to do there, set up on the, as a standby. We've got a British release we haven't actually released in Britain yet. We're releasing over there on the 30th of September. We've got German release in October. So we've got a busy schedule, but we do want to break in America more than anything um, right now. And that's why we've we've done very. S it's it's not a small venue tour. It's more a small. We've only got about a total of about 15 dates, and we're hoping to link up with a major act is is the idea behind it. And I'm sure we will. I've got great management now, which I've never had before. 
I, I, I signed a management agreement about two months ago with Grant Edwards, who are big countries management as a matter of fact, part of the family again. Um, and I'm sure they'll get something good happening for us. And there's a, there's a lot of times within record companies that the, the people in the companies don't seem to know what's going on. Maybe for some, for someone like Polygram, something like Polygram, being so vast, it's very hard to keep tabs for the people within the company, unless they're gonna call um, mass meetings every day to something like 3,000 staff. You know, it's impossible. Um, so you really need good management to keep going in and gin them up a bit. Well, hopefully you've got some good management. You sounded fantastic tonight. Great. I'm looking forward to your next tour. And uh, good luck, everybody. Thank you, really. Eddie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.